An angel of the Lord appeared before them. Be not afraid. No. <laughs> Be afraid. <laughs> Be very afraid. <laughs> Hello and welcome to our Angelology panel in which we are going to describe the representation of angels in three different religions, namely Judaism, Christianity and Islam. Um, my name is Daria and in the Good Omens fandom I write fan fiction and occasionally meta. And I'm going to kick start this panel. Um, we are going to begin with a short introduction to the topic um, of uh, angels in general in these uh, religions that we're going to describe. So these are very general ideas of what it means to be an angel, so to say. And uh, these ideas uh, persist across these three different religions. So all of us are going to go into more detail about them uh, in a while. Uh, but uh, before we do that, it's also important to say that probably the reason why this is true, why we have these common, uh, let's say, ways of looking at the same thing is because all of these uh, three religions originated from one in particular, which is called Zoroastrianism. Yeah, so this religion um, is one of the oldest religions in the world. And in fact, it was also one of the most powerful ones. Yeah, so that also explains why it has such a big influence on these, uh, on these three uh, religions. So uh, here you can also see a symbol of Zoroastrianism and it preceded and influenced other uh, other religions we're talking about here, yeah? so other monotheistic, yeah, so the religions that have only one god, uh, other monotheistic religions. So I'm going to briefly outline um, what Zoroastrianism postulates, and you will see the resemblance, in fact, yeah, and in everything that we're going to say in the future. So Zoroastrianism originated several thousand years ago in, um, in Persia, so it's Southwest Asia. And the first thing to mention is, uh, like I said before, there is one god who is called Ahura Mazda, and uh, this god is like a supreme being is, and also a supreme source of uh, good and right yeah, in this religion. And god also has six or seven, depending on the source, emanations or attributes. Yeah? So they are called Amish's pantas, and they are something like archangels to translate this into more, uh, to translate this into more uh, understandable terms. So these are six or seven uh, divine beings that communicate uh, some kind of virtue that is characteristic of uh, Ahura Mazda. Yeah? And we have the list of Amish spenders here on the right. Uh, so in fear of uh, butchering the pronunciation in the original language, I'm not going to read this, but you also have the translation into English. So we have the Holy Spirit, good mind, truth, right-mindedness, kingdom, wholeness and immortality. So these are different beings with these particular functions of, um, let's say, communicating this, this particular virtue. Yeah. So this is how we can say that um, they, are, they are archangels. Yeah. They're some kind of powerful beings that communicate this uh, aspect of righteousness. Also in Zoroastrianism, we have something we have a concept which is something like guardian angels they're called fravashi and um, essentially these are the souls of dead ancestors yeah so we have some kind of let's say some kind of supernatural being that is assigned or can be assigned to particular people to guard them and to protect them yeah from evil and from some maybe bad choices to advise them as well yeah and so on. Um, so also what's interesting in Zoroastrianism already, we have counterparts of the forces of good. So there is the counterpart of the Holy Spirit, who is called Angra Menu. And um, this, uh, this being has actually a lot of 
traits in common with uh, the character whom we know as Satan, yeah? So it's like the kind of very, uh, very large uh, source of evil, in fact. And there are also counterparts of the, uh, of the uh, Amish as Pentas, yeah? So of these divine beings, and they're called divas, yeah? And it's interesting that probably this word uh, diva, so singular, a diva is singular, divas is plural, Probably this, uh, this was the origin of the word devil, it's possible. I'm not sure, but there is this idea and it would make sense because they are essentially devils or uh, maleficent um, beings that, wants, that don't want humans to become better or to grow or to join the, uh, the manifestations of God, but they want to, uh, to interfere yeah, with human lives uh, in, a, in a bad way. So um, it's interesting, you can already see that uh, already there, uh, there was this uh, distinction between forces of good and forces of evil. And you can also see that the forces of good, um, that the angels were necessarily also the forces of good. So like I said at the very beginning, they are benevolent. Yeah, so they have goodwill for, uh, for humans. So this was a very short introduction, um, and uh, then uh, now we're going to move on to the next uh, part of our panel, and uh, then in the further parts you will also see that there are a lot of common, uh, common features uh, between these different religions and how they, see, uh, how they see angels. So let's move on to the next part. Hi, I'm Val, also known as Johnny Happy Goff, and I'll be giving you an overview of angels and demons in Judaism. First, though, a quick rundown on the structure of the Jewish scriptures. First and foremost are the Torah, which is the five books of Moses, and the rest of the Tanakh, aka the Old Testament. This is the central text that everything else is based on. It is super old, contains a lot of stuff that presumably made sense at the time, and requires a lot of interpretation. Then there's the Mishnah, which is a written compendium of the oral Torah, all the laws, statutes, and traditions that aren't in the written Torah, but are considered to have been given by God along with it, and the Gemara, which is rabbinical analysis and commentary on the Mishnah. Put those together and you get the Talmud. And then there are the Midrashim, which were written by all sorts of different rabbis over a very, very long period of time. There are the Halachic Midrashim, which are legal interpretations, and there are the Agadic Midrashim, which include commentary and homiletical interpretations of Torah, folklore, historical anecdotes, moral exhortations, and practical advice. And on top of all that, there's mysticism. My main source frequently cites the Zohar, which is the main text of Kabbalah, the best known form of Jewish mysticism, but certainly not the only one. The point is, there are a lot of sources spanning a lot of time, and they all disagree, and in fact frequently consist of accounts of arguments, because that's what Judaism is. For everything I say here, there are going to be a dozen other versions. So if something I say contradicts what you've heard elsewhere, yeah, probably. My main source is Tree of Souls by Howard Schwartz, which compiles various myths, folk tales, and mystical beliefs from sources including but not limited to the above with commentary. So with all that said, here we go. To begin with, of greater personal concern in Judaism than angels or demons are the good inclination, Yetzer HaTov, and the evil inclination, Yetzer HaRa. You don't get to point at something outside yourself and go, the devil made me do it. Satan or a demon may have tempted you, but you are ultimately responsible for your own behavior. Angels are fundamentally servants of God. They've got more than one role. They're often classified as either ministering angels or avenging angels, angels of punishment or angels of destruction. Angel comes from the Greek angelus, which is a translation of malach, messenger, or one who is sent, which word is used for both divine and human messengers in the Tanakh, although it's rarely used for humans in modern Hebrew. This is only one of the terms which get lumped under angel, though. Laura will be talking about different types later, and they'll at least touch on the Jewish hierarchies, but suffice it to say that there are at least five different rankings, all of which list ten types, and they're all in completely different orders. 
In Genesis Rabbah, it says that human beings share four characteristics with animals. They eat and drink, they procreate, they excrete, and they die, and that they share four characteristics with these celestial beings. They were created in the image of God, they stand upright, they speak and understand, and they have peripheral vision. We can see from this that angels are strictly spiritual beings. Quoting directly here, when they are sent to this world to carry out a mission, they become clothed in a body formed from air or fire. Thus, they appear in human form, but as soon as they complete their duties, they divest themselves of their bodies and return to their spiritual state. In the Tanakh, there are multiple instances where a being is introduced as the angel of the Lord, who then both acts and speaks and is addressed as though they actually are God. The reason for this is ambiguous. They might actually be an avatar or manifestation of God, or it might just have been the custom for an emissary to act and be treated as the person they're representing. The only actual Tanakhic examples of named angels are Michael and Gabriel, both in the book of Daniel, and they're also the angels we hear about the most outside of the Tanakh. If a task is high profile and doesn't obviously belong to another angel, it's most likely Gabriel or Michael doing it. There's one story about Gabriel feeding the infant Abraham with milk and honey from his thumb like a dispenser, causing him to grow at the rate of a year a day. He's also the one who takes a soul from the treasury of souls when it's time for a human to be conceived, and it actually says he just grabs the first one that comes to hand. If two major angels are mentioned together doing something like spreading out the heavens like a canopy or just standing on either side of God's throne, they're almost always these two. If four are mentioned together, they're Gabriel, Michael, Raphael, and Uriel, who are mentioned in the Book of Enoch. There is said to be an angel who has dominion over each of the elements, where elements is very loosely defined. Gabriel is the prince of fire, and Michael is the prince of hail. Rahab, the prince of the sea, is also mentioned in a lot of stories, and there's one account that at one point God reassigned all the elements as an obstacle against angel summoning to effectively ensure that people trying to do so would get a wrong number. Every nation also has its patron or guardian angel, which we would call a principality, and Michael is the prince of Israel, as well as being high priest in the heavenly temple. Uriel, in particular, is said to have spoken to Enoch, and in some accounts may have been the one to wrestle with Jacob, although this is also attributed to Michael, Samael, or God in person. Raphael is cited as the angel of healing and is also the designated thwarter of a few major demons and is the one who was tasked with binding and imprisoning the fallen angel Azazel. Sandalphon, while not a member of this quartet, is still prominent in Jewish lore, being the angel who gathers the daily prayers of the children of Israel and weaves them into crowns or garlands with which to adorn God. He is sometimes said to be the tallest of the angels, which is hilarious, and is also sometimes said to have once been the prophet Elijah, although this fortunately doesn't work with the Good Omens timeline due to his presence at Sodom and Gomorrah, so I don't have to take his portrayal as an insult to my boy Elijah. Another angel said to have once been human is Metatron, who, according to some traditions, used to be Noah's great-grandfather, Enoch. Metatron is generally considered the highest of the angels and is sometimes accorded quasi-divine status. He serves as the heavenly scribe and prince of the treasuries of heaven. And now we come, of course, to Aziraphale. Or rather, we don't. Genesis 3.24, the Torah verse which inspired the character, reads in the King James Version, So he drove out the man, and he placed at the east of the Garden of Eden cherubims and a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way of the Tree of Life. Setting aside my objection to cherubims, which is a double plural, they and the sword are listed as separate things. There are Jewish stories featuring an angel with a flaming sword, but there are also stories where the sword appears all by itself and is simply depicted as a spinning, fiery, autonomous hover sword. Obviously, this is not the case in Good Omens, but it does suggest that Aziraphale can probably do some pretty sweet sword tricks. Other interesting angels include Raziel, the Angel of Secrets, Radweriel, the Keeper of the Book of Records, Galizur, who utters all of God's evil decrees so God doesn't have to, and Lila, the Angel of Conception, who watches over gestating fetuses and teaches them everything there is to know, but then when they're born, boops them on the upper lip and causes them to forget, and that's why you have a philtrum. 
Now, angels are not morally perfect. In particular, they tend to be jealous of the creation of man, of Enoch's elevation, of Moses' ascent. Usually they stand down when God tells them to, but sometimes we get fallen angels. Lucifer does appear in Jewish mythology, but not at all prominently. It's the standard story about the highest archangel who tried to set himself up as the equal of God and God cast him and his followers into a bottomless abyss. That's the entire story, though. He doesn't appear after that, and he's a completely separate figure from Satan. Satan is an authorized tempter and heavenly prosecutor and is actively answerable to God. There may or may not even be a single entity called Satan, as it means adversary and is probably more like a job title. A named angel sometimes associated with this title is Samael, Prince of the Accusers. There is a similar story to Lucifer's sometimes attached to Satan, but in this one, when Adam was created and the angels were ordered to bow down to him, Satan and his followers refused and were cast down to earth. The fallen angel story I've seen the most about is Shemhazai and Azazel, who are said to be the sons of God in Genesis 6 who fathered the Nephilim. In the generation before the flood, God began to regret having made humans. Shemhazai and Azazel reminded God that they had been against it from the start. God told them that everyone who lives on earth is subject to the evil inclination and they wouldn't do any better. These two angels, or in other versions, an entire order of 200 angels called the Watchers, led by Shemhazai, asked to go live on earth to prove they could, and God said okay. These angels were resolved to resist the evil inclination, but it lasted about five seconds, and as soon as they saw women, they forgot their vows, took lovers, and taught them the secrets of heaven, sorcery, taught the men how to forge weapons, and the women how to make themselves attractive to men. Oh no. Shemhazai ultimately repented and punished himself, hanging himself upside down between heaven and earth. But Azazel was unrepentant, and God ordered Raphael to bind him in chains and hang him upside down in a canyon in the desert Dudael, and he's still there, but he still manages to make trouble like a crime boss running things from jail. The closest thing in Judaism to hell is called Gehenna, although far from being eternal punishment, no one stays there for more than a year, so it's functionally closer to purgatory. A number of different fallen or otherwise nasty angels are said to be the prince of Gehenna, including Satan, Samael, Arciel, and Duma, who used to be the principality of Egypt. This is a good place to mention Azrael, the angel of death, who is often thought of as evil or even the ultimate evil, but still definitely takes orders from God. He can go anywhere except the legendary city of Luz, which means everyone living there is immortal, but not unaging, as long as they stay there. It's also said that he cannot take someone while they are studying the Torah. So now we come to demons, which are not the same as fallen angels, or at least not always. Demons are pretty much always considered dangerous, but not necessarily malicious, although they can be. Words usually translated as demons include seirim, literally he goats, which are mentioned in Leviticus as something not to sacrifice to and are sometimes equated to satyrs. Mazikin, which are harmful invisible demons which cause both minor annoyances and greater dangers found in daily life, and Shedim, which basically refers to foreign gods whom Judaism has effectively demoted. Shedim are mentioned twice in the Tanakh, both times in contexts involving child or animal sacrifices. They are variously said to be the descendants of serpents or of demons in serpent form, an obvious allusion to the serpent of Eden, to be spirits who were meant to be humans but their bodies were not finished by the end of the sixth day, or to be the children of Lilith, on whom more in a bit. Shadim are said to be like angels in three ways and like humans in three ways. Like angels, they have wings, they fly from one end of the world to the other, and they can tell the future. Like humans, they eat and drink, they procreate, and they die. It doesn't mention anything about excreting this time. They're also said to have the feet of a rooster, so you can tell them by their feet or their footprints. On the whole, Shadim are a bit more like jinn than Christian demons. They can cause sickness and misfortune, but they can also be helpful and can even live according to the Torah, which can be seen in folktales about the kingdom of demons, which is not hell nor indeed Gehenna, and which is ruled by Ashmedai, aka Asmodeus. 
Asmodeus appears in the Book of Tobit, where he is wholly malicious, but he also shows up in the Talmud, where he seems to be largely good-natured. He also appears in many folk tales, where he can be either, depending on the story. Asmodeus is married to Lilith, who is a very big deal in Jewish demonology. Her name is mentioned in the Book of Isaiah. She is, of course, the queen of the demons, and in mysticism, she represents the feminine aspect of evil. She's a very interesting figure and in fact has two main roles, which were probably derived from two different Babylonian demons, Lamashtu and Lilitu, which got folded into one. In the former role, she's the specter of infant mortality and the dangers of childbearing and appears as a witch-like figure who goes around strangling infants and sometimes preying on the mothers as well. In the latter role, she's a demon of lust who seduces men to their destruction and who is responsible for sexual fantasies and what Howard Schwartz terms nocturnal emissions. These roles are so disparate that sometimes they're still interpreted as two different beings, both called Lilith, grandmother Lilith the Great and her daughter Lilith the Younger. There is even considered to be conflict between the two and, quoting Schwartz directly here, on Yom Kippur the two Liliths go forth into the desert and screech. Lilith is, of course, said to have a great many lovers, and in particular is associated with both Samael and Ashmedai. When there are two Liliths, the elder is married to Samael and the younger to Ashmedai. A popular origin story about her, though of course not the only one, says that she was created together with Adam as his first wife, but they fought over who got to be on top during sex. Neither of them would back down, and finally Lilith spoke God's name, which is the usual method of working miracles in Jewish lore, and flew away and went to live in a cave by the Red Sea, where she took a whole bunch of demons as lovers. Adam prayed to complain, and God sent the angels Senoi, Sansenoi, and Semangalov to bring her back. They found her and threatened to drown a hundred of her demonic offspring every day if she didn't return. This doesn't seem to particularly bother her. Evidently, she pursues a quantity-based reproductive strategy. At this point, she declares that she was created to strangle newborn infants, boys up to eight days old and girls up to 20 days old, which sounds like a bit of a non sequitur and seems to be a not terribly smooth merging of two different stories. She proposes that she can be thwarted by the three angels in that she'll leave any baby alone if she sees their names on an amulet hung on its crib, and the angels agree, although drowning a hundred of her offspring daily is still part of the deal. You could say they're considered disposable. The whole negotiation is remarkably civil and honestly has a bit of an Aziraphale and Crowley feel to it. The angels seem to be Lilith's official adversaries slash bridge club. Meanwhile, the matter of her returning to Adam is evidently just dropped and God ends up making Eve instead. Official adversaries are actually something that comes up more than once, with notable demons having a particular angel who has power over them and can be invoked against them. As a final note, while in the lore, the Serpent of Eden often is or is associated with a demon or Satan or Samael, in the actual text of the Torah, it appears to be just a serpent and seems to serve as a just so story for, among other things, why snakes got no legs. And now, over to Laura. Hit me up later if you want to hear the fairy tale about the demon princess and the divorce court. Intermediaries between God and humanity. As Christianity itself sprang out of Judaism, most of the information we have about them is rooted in Jewish texts. Um, various theologians have since attempted to place them into some kind of organized structure, but this seems to have begun later. Most angels that appear do so in humanoid form, um, without wings, and don't identify themselves. We only know they're angels because the text tells us, or from contextual clues. There's a verse in Hebrews which warns to entertain strangers, um, just in case they later turn out to be angels. There are only two named angels that appear in all versions of the Bible, um, these being Michael and Gabriel, and only Michael is specifically called an archangel, so a lot of people consider him specifically to be in charge of them all. Uh, Metatron is given this role in a lot of media, uh, but isn't mentioned in any canonical source to Christians. Michael is called the Great Prince in uh, Daniel 12, uh, but one of the chief princes in Daniel 10. So there must be others of high rank, uh, but Michael is the only one we can be absolutely sure of. Catholic and Orthodox Bibles add Raphael, who's generally considered to be an archangel. Uh, most Protestants don't consider the book he appears in to be canonical, uh, but some groups regard it as uh, deuterocanonical, which is like a secondary level of canon. 
Michael, Gabriel and Raphael are considered saints by the Catholics, uh, which is hilarious if Raphael turns out to be Crowley. Uh, they and sometimes Uriel have a feast day on the 29th of September, uh, which is named Saint Michael and All Angels. Uh, you may have seen churches with the same name. Uh, or Michaelmas. And uh, if you're my sort of age and sang in primary school, you're probably humming a song about vegetables under your breath now. Protestant Bibles include the name uh, Abaddon or Apollyon, depending on the translation, who is described as the Angel of the Abyss, uh, though he's generally considered fallen. A lot of the other names we're given come from sources considered non-canonical by Christians, um, many of them from the Book of Enoch, which I'm almost entirely convinced is Sandalpan's self-insert fic. Metatron also appears here, as well as in the Jewish Talmud. Several angels, including Gabriel and Raphael, are called Dark Angels in Enoch. And as Raphael describes himself in Tobit as one of seven, it's a fairly common belief that there are seven of them. Uriel appears both in Enoch and in another non-canonical book called Esdras, um, which also names Jeremiah, whereas Eastern Orthodox tradition names Uriel, Salafiel, Jehudiel and Barachiel as archangels, in addition to the original three. Most commonly, Uriel appears alone with these three to make a set of four, um, but there are many conflicting lists. The names of some are given as alternative names for others, often then for other lists to include both names. Uh, some say Uriel is an alternative name for Raphael, but I don't think I've yet seen a list that included Uriel alone. Most Archangel lists include a handful of names, but some believe there to be thousands just in this one rank. Those of you that follow Neil on Tumblr or Twitter will know that there's considered to be a difference between Archangels with a capital A and Archangels with a lowercase a. And these conflicting accounts could be the reason for there being two groups with the same name. It's difficult to think of it as a single top rank if there are meant to be so many of them. Absolutely none of these lists are consistent. Uh, and that's because they've been pieced together post-canon. The inclusion of the word archangel and canonical accounts of some angels asking others to do things implies that there are ranks and there are several types of angel described, uh, but we can't really say for sure uh, that any aside from the archangels are any higher than the others. The hierarchy most often referred to uh, was first written down by a Greek scholar Pseudo Dionysus, who lived in the 5th century. In his work, he portrayed himself as another man of the same name, hence the Pseudo. The original Dionysus is said to have been converted by the Apostle Paul and uh, went on to become the first bishop of Athens, which likely lent weight to his impersonator's opinions. His list looks like this. The ranks are divided into three levels, known as spheres, each of which contains three ranks or choirs. Aziraphale is in the top rank of the third sphere in most versions of Good Omens. Um, Radio Aziraphale does call himself a Malachim, which is listed as a different rank in some sources, but it does in fact simply translate as angel or messenger, and it was probably used to be more inclusive, because it's a rank seen in Jewish sources, and the Islamic word for an angel is also Malak, uh, so it could be that his rank wasn't adjusted at all. A couple of years ago, I tried to write an average list for writing purposes um, by looking at which ranks appeared most frequently and in which order, and I just ended up with this same list. He's said to have written this down following visions and meditations, so we don't know all of the reasoning he used, but a lot of those that came later reached either the same or very similar conclusions. Some words have been translated in multiple ways, uh, just to confuse things. Uh, a power can be a rank in its own right, or it can be a, an older translation of what we would now call a virtue. The only Jewish names which seem to remain unchanged and appear on all lists are the cherubim and seraphim. The primary Jewish source for a hierarchy uh, is a part of the Talmud, from a medieval Jewish philosopher named Moses ben Maimon, who is also known as Maimonides. He gives us ten ranks. Although he doesn't use the title of Archangel, he does name Michael, Gabriel, Raphael and Uriel as the four angels surrounding God's throne, uh, which isn't a unique belief, and some have interpreted this to mean that, uh, that there are four kinds of angel. If you've ever heard the traditional prayer of protection requested that they watch over the sleeper, this is where this specific arrangement comes from. Neither of these lists were the first. Um, the earliest surviving one seems to be from the Apostolic Constitutions, which is a 4th century collection of eight books about morals and the early church. It's called Apostolic because it's meant to have been the work of the Twelve Apostles, despite being written long after they died and one having been replaced by two others. The word can refer to a missionary, but it seems to have been represented as being written by the original Twelve. If we take a look at the different sources side by side, we can start to see how the list evolved over time. Once we have all of these lists laid out, uh, you can see how the average list came about. 
Uh, as for equivalence between the two religions, the Ophanim are generally considered to be thrones. Uh, it's implied in the first book of Enoch, but it is mostly down to contextual clues. Seraphim and Cherubim remain unchanged from one set of lists to the other. Um, the others are less clear, but we do have an idea, however down to educated guesswork it may be, um, as to what some of them do or are responsible for. And in comparing these two sets of traits, I think it's possible that I may have made another match. But to explain this, I first need to speak about how angels look. There's a reason that angels tell people to be not afraid, because the average person is going to be immediately terrified. Only a handful appear in humanoid form, so as to lower the chance of scaring humans witless, and they do it for good reason. The less likely an angel is to come into direct contact with humans, the less human they look. It's really only for the big stuff that the others allow themselves to be seen. When less or non-humanoid angels appear to people, they come bearing responsibility, which is a whole other reason to be afraid. We're told how four kinds look. The cherubim either take two slightly different forms or else Maimonides was correct to think of them as two types. In Ezekiel, they have four wings, two of which support God's throne. Uh, they also have four faces. Uh, one resembles a human's, one a lion's, uh, one an eagle's, and one is either described as an ox's or just as a cherub's. They're straight-legged, with feet like a calf's, have human hands beneath the wings, and gleam like polished brass. They are said to burn like torches, with a bright fire out of which lightning goes forth. In Revelation they have six wings, and there are four individuals, each of which take the form of one of these four animals, but entirely covered in eyes. They surround the throne of God and cry out, holy, 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 on a loop. Both kinds, or forms, are called living creatures or living beings, and uh, Hayat HaKadesh does translate as sacred animals. The cherubim were the guardians of Eden, which means that Aziraphale must have been shuffled around at some point, uh, and you can see why they might be given this job. Uh, with that many eyes and faces, they're not likely to miss anything. Seraphim are described by Isaiah as fiery flying serpents, radiating brilliant light and again covered in eyes on all sides. They have six wings, two to cover their faces, two to cover their feet and two to fly. No one has ever recorded how these hidden parts look. Uh, it's rare enough that they're seen at all. Their name means burning ones, uh, which seems to refer literally to the destruction of a fire, and uh, fire and its associated colours are a common theme. Like the living creatures, they surround God's throne and cry out, holy, holy, holy. Uh, so there's some possible overlap again. Seraph is also frequently used for snakes in the Bible, perhaps as a reference to the effect of venom. And as with the cherubim, there's a lot of local flying snake imagery, uh, particularly in Egypt. The Ophanim are referred to as the many-eyed ones and appear as interlocked wheels with spokes and eyes all around the rims. They are wreathed in flame, shining the colour of beryl, topaz or chrysolite, again depending on the translation, which all come in shades of yellow. Their name means wheels, spheres or whirlwinds, uh, and they're thought by some to be the literal wheels of God's chariot. They potentially bear some resemblance to earth lights or Foo Fighters, not the band. They're both round, unexplained, and come in the same range of colours, so perhaps often them are seen more often than we realise. I mention earth lights uh, because they're meant to be a volcanic phenomenon, uh, as is something that resembles the Hashmalim. These angels appear in Ezekiel in the form of a windstorm. No visible wings, eyes, or any other body parts to speak of, um, with fire and lightning, and surrounded by brilliant light. We're told that the centre of the clouds look like glowing metal. When I read this description, I immediately thought of a volcanic storm, um, which are often seen alongside some of the worst volcanic eruptions. Perhaps they're holding the volcanoes back. Hashmal translates as amber, which could refer to either colour or lightning, since amber rubbed with the cloth creates static. It's because they appear as a storm that I think that they may be the virtues, uh, which are called the shining ones and the spirits of motion. They're said to have control over the elements and assist in governing nature. Uh, it's possible that they were present to transport the group with the wind. A lot of the other Jewish names um, just translate as angel or messenger, so it's difficult to even begin to match them up. The theologians think they have an idea of the tasks they're thought to perform, and through those it's perhaps possible to get an idea of why Pseudo Dionysus wrote the list that he did. The first sphere closest to God, the second aiding and governing Earth from a distance, and the third helping and contacting Earth directly. 
The regular angels are thought to include guardians and messengers, which matches the little we hear of them. Archangels tend to announce the big things. Uh, the principalities guide and protect groups and nations. And uh, there's a popular theory that uh, Aziraphale is the principality of LGBT plus people. Uh, and then we have powers, which are so named because they have power over the forces of darkness and protect from the harm they inflict. And uh, dominions or dominations, depending on the translation, which are meant to aid earthly authorities established by God to manage wisely and aid in self-control. There's a lot of artwork, but the original visions or visitations can be very difficult to picture. If they don't appear human, the descriptions have to be interpreted, uh, which can be made difficult by translation and the evolution of language over time. Uh, and we don't know how literal some of these descriptions were to begin with. Uh, you see the same thing with older paintings of newly discovered animals, um, some of which were interpreted as monsters by those who hadn't seen them directly. Angels are terrifying. Some may appear human at times, but we don't know that they always look this way, only that this is how they appear when they don't want to freak people out. We can try to categorise them, assign them roles, and in a sense, this makes them seem safer because this is what they are and this is what they do. But we just don't know. Canonically, we only know these things. That they were created by and joyfully serve God. That they were in existence by the sixth day of creation at the latest that they do not age or die or marry, that they experience emotions, have far greater power than humans and can perform miracles, but are finite. They are not to be worshipped or prayed to. They are wise and intelligent, that some can fly, that they are fast, have a will and are too numerous to count, that their names include Michael, Gabriel, Raphael, that Michael and perhaps Raphael are archangels, that Michael likely heads them all, that there are at least four kinds or forms beside the humanoid, that there are seraphim, cherubim, ophanim, hashmalim, and possibly separate Hayot HaKadesh, that most either literally flame or bear those colours, that some are covered in eyes, that they can have up to six wings, have four faces or none at all, that they work invisibly, heal and guard, carry messages from heaven, that they will be present and involved when the world ends, that they can literally take away your voice or turn you into salt, that they can destroy whole armies and wipe entire cities from the map. That a third of them fell. Imagine that kind of being, that kind of power, without restraint. So where do these other rank names come from? Colossians 1.16 gives us thrones, dominions, principalities and powers. And Ephesians 1.21 gives us rulers, authorities or powers, powers or virtues and dominions. None of these words refer explicitly to angels. We only know that they were created by and are lower than God. Which from a Christian perspective refers to literally everything. So in terms of rank and type, all we can be absolutely sure of from the Christian perspective is this, which probably don't look much like the angels you know. All right, so let's move on to the last part of our panel, which will be the representation of angels in Islam. And the main source of anything that you would like to know about angels in Islam would be Quran, of course. And uh, it's very important also to note that the belief in the angels or the angels of God, uh, as we say, is fundamental to uh, Islam. And um, there are uh, six so-called articles of faith. So... Uh, six beliefs that define the Islamic way of life and uh, one of them is actually the belief uh, in angels. 
So it's very important in Islam, but um, somehow uh, there is uh, no dogmatic angelology in Islam per se. So we have sometimes different interpretations of, cer uh, of certain ideas, certain things in Islam, but there is no, let's say, whole interconnected one big idea on some things, let's say. There are some things that uh, different perspectives have in common, of course. So what we call angel in English is called malak in Islam. And this is basically a kind of virtuous spirit of the divine world that uh, lives with the God and uh, uh, passes on the word of God and uh, God's humans. But these angels are not messengers necessarily. So this is a deviation from what I talked about at the very beginning that in Islam um, the messenger part of angels is not uh, not so big yeah so in Islam we have a different word a different term for a messenger and messengers can actually be not only uh, angelic or supernatural but they can also include humans as well yeah so being a messenger is not limited to uh, the supernatural beings. Um, in the main sources, um, angels are sometimes mentioned by name, sometimes they're mentioned by their function. And I will go into more depth um, regarding angelic functions just in a moment. Uh, but functions can vary quite greatly. So, uh, and usually there is one specific function assigned, uh, assigned to a specific angel. So you could say that being an angel is, is a function in a way, yeah, in Islam. And uh, the, the next thing is uh, something I personally found interesting is that we can also have angels of mercy and angels of punishment. So there are two different ways of uh, uh, being righteous in a way yeah, in uh, Islam. So angels can bring mercy to you. They can ask for forgiveness. They may want to forgive you, um, to bring this forgiveness onto you, but uh, they can also punish you for something. Yeah? So that's pretty interesting. These two types of angels, they are created in different ways and they are quite distinct. So that's also uh, an interesting, two interesting categories. And uh, the proof that angels are actually very important in, uh, in Islam is that angelic names are often carved on amulets in exorcism. Uh, right. So um, this is a sign that they really, they protect from evil and they assist in some, uh, in some situations when some kind of good influence has to, uh, has to step in. Um, so uh, moving on to the functions of angels, uh, the main one, the most crucial one is protection from evil. So everything is kind of tied to that. Um, all angels want to uh, to be the force of good, they are the force of good, and uh, they protect humans from, uh, from different uh, adversities. Yeah? So this is the main function. And the next big function is that they glorify God. So they obey God, and they spread the word of God, and uh, they are obedient by nature yeah? to God. There are some more, uh, more specific functions, such as recording actions of every human being. So there is an angel who actually does that and who knows every single thing that you've done. And uh, there are also uh, angels who take souls uh, at the time of death. So once you die, there is an angel who's going to escort your soul into the um, next place yeah, where you're supposed to be. So those were some broad functions. And um, now we're going to look at some examples of angels who are mentioned by name and function, yeah, in the, uh, in the sources. So um, here on the left, I included the names, yeah, from the original sources. And on the right is something like um, an analogous name. And you can see that there are a lot of similarities. Yeah, so this is in English. Yeah, this is the Islamic rendition of it. So you can see there are a lot of parallels, even the, when you read the names, they're going to sound very similar in your head. So like I said, uh, it, it brings us back to what I said at the very beginning, uh, that um, 
there are a lot of similarities in monotheistic religions among uh, between uh, monotheistic religions in that um, even the names overlap yeah this is pretty interesting so we have gabriel who is the uh, the angel of revelation we have michael the angel of mercy yeah uh, we have the next angel who is often associated with raphael yeah and this is the angel who signals the end of time and the coming of judgment day and the last one here is azrael the angel of death so very specific functions very specific names um the last bit i'm going to talk about is what distinguishes an angel in the islamic view yeah characteristics of angels so first of all angels are anthropomorphic so they have human-like traits um, but they also have supernatural features so something that distinguishes them from humans so things like wings of course um, they are also often described as beings of great size and beauty and they also often carry heavenly articles, so something only a heavenly being can wield and not a human being, yeah? So also angels are created from light, and that sets them apart from humans who are born, of course, and uh, also it highlights their divine origins, yeah, because they're created from light. Um, they also obey God, yeah? So they follow his word, and uh, this point may raise an interesting uh, question whether angels have free will in Islam. And uh, there are different interpretations of this that I found. Some uh, say that uh, no, they don't. Some say yes, they still do. And there is one uh, in particular that I personally found very interesting. And this is that, uh, yes, uh, yeah, in fact, they, they do. Um, and uh, the reason they are obedient is because they want to be obedient, because they choose to be. Yeah? So they can still choose to uh, obey or not obey, but they choose to obey because, uh, because they love God and they want to follow, uh, follow the, um, the word of God. Yeah, so that's why it happens. Yeah, so it's not that they just have to. Yeah, but they actually choose to. So that's pretty interesting. Um, also, angels in Islam uh, don't have bodily desires, so they don't need to eat, to drink, um, unlike humans. Um, so that's another quite familiar, familiar characteristic. And they're also often described as uh, creatures of purity. So, uh, so they're described as pure, and uh, in fact, in some uh, sources, I found that, um, for example, um, a guardian angel can uh, can be repulsed by acts of impurity committed by a human being. Yeah, so they are actually put off by this because they are so pure. Yeah. Um, and uh, yes, so that's uh, that's the main uh, the main uh, list of the main uh, characteristics of angels in Islam, and that's pretty much all I wanted to uh, to share about them. Um, the very last thing would be just for you to have a kind of um, idea of how they're represented in art. Um, you can see two examples, two works of art in this slide um depicting uh, different angels yeah and you can already notice at the first glance that they look very different from uh from western representation so first of all the color schemes are very different and uh also the details are very different so you can notice that the wings look also quite different and there are sometimes several pairs of wings so there can be two pairs uh, sometimes i think up to four yeah so there can be a few pairs of wings and you can also see that uh, they have some human-like traits uh, but they are not humans obviously yeah so uh, they also have some heavenly attributes to them uh, both come from the six, uh, from the 16th century by the way yeah um, yeah, so uh, this is for you to have a kind of impression, and that concludes our panel. So uh, we are Daria, it's me, Laura, and 
Valerie. And we thank you very much for uh, staying, uh, staying with us and uh, watching this panel. Two things to say before we conclude is that um, Number one would be that, uh, of course, everything that we talked about is non-exhaustive, so you can definitely find out more and read more, but because we have time constraints, we couldn't include everything we, we would want uh, and everything we wanted. Um, so there's a lot more to read on uh, these religions and also on a lot of other religions that describe some, um, let's say, good and evil spirits, yeah, in a different way, but still, it's it's an, uh, those are interesting reads. Uh, so definitely go and then check them out. Um, and uh, thing number two would be that um, we uh, we have done our best to include the most interesting details in the best possible way. But um, if you have any comments or maybe any questions or any reflections, uh, it would be great if you wanted to share them with us. If you want to. So I also included our Twitter handles here. Uh, so this is me, Ineffable Martin, Obliquity Rights, and Shiny Happy Goth. So uh, we'd be happy to uh, answer any of your questions. Um, and uh, I think that's that's about it when it comes to that. Um, so once again, thank you very much for uh, attending this panel. We really hope that you have learned something new, something interesting uh, for yourself. And um, well, thanks very much and enjoy the rest of the ineffable con.